ni jenonga boja nunak nini ni jenonga boja nunak nini ni jenonga ngalak ngak this is nonga country we are sitting here this is nonga country this is our motherland the boja special place for nonga people <laughs> Chingarup Sanctuary is a 576 hectare bushland property situated beside the Karakarup Creek inland of Bremer Bay on Western Australia's south coast. A Perth-based couple, Eddie and Donna Wayon, purchased this land for conservation in 2002. It was the very first property acquired for ecological restoration as part of the Gondwana Link. We, we've effectively owned this property since 2002, 14 years and uh, we bought it to preserve bushland and enjoy the wildflowers, but it's turned out to be more than that. It's turned out to be an ecological restoration journey as well. We now have about 450 species of flora on our property that we know of, um, 550 fauna species, including 105 birds and 250 moths. And this is all through the cooperation of people, friends, organisations throughout the world and locally. Just an amazing, you know, involvement of people and, and knowledge that we've gathered on the property. One of the really interesting things about the property is that we are seeing now Mallee fowl every single time we come. And they stroll, they kind of waddle here and there, and they were under the fruit orchard. I was weeding there and they came and were eating the grubs underneath and you could see them scratching the ground. It's just such a wonderful feeling to have these beautiful birds come back onto the property. A key part of the Gondwana Link vision is reconnecting habitats between the Stirling Range and Fitzgerald River National Parks. Greening Australia replanted 80 hectares of cleared land on the property. Over the years, the ongoing work at Chingarup has been helped by Green Skills, the Conservation Council of WA, Bush Heritage, other groups and many volunteers, all carrying out a range of management, research and monitoring. So much has happened here. Bird mist netting, fauna pit trapping, bird nest surveys, moth light trapping, baiting for feral predators, bat detecting, plant surveys and wildlife photography, restoration planting and monitoring, dieback hygiene measures, stream monitoring, all helping to increase our ability to care for the natural environment. One of the features of the area are the river pools along the Chingarup and Karakarup creeks. They form part of the life-nourishing wetlands across Gonwinaling, providing a special refuge for a wide range of wildlife, especially in times of drought. Geraldine and Steve Janicki are river ecologists surveying the health of these streams. These river pools here in the, the Karakarup and Chingarup, they're uh, terrific pools in that they've got good, long, deep pools within them that are refugia for all sorts of aquatic uh, animals uh, and the birds of course as well. Uh, they're moderately healthy which is fantastic and it's exciting to see all the reveg work and uh, would, it'd be really interesting to see how that impacts all these river pools over the coming years because I believe that they will. Early reports were that there was fresh water in the Karakarup so there must be areas where there's a little freshwater seeps and it'll be great to see those come back and uh, the different aquatic biota as things come back into the system again. So some of the things that we tend to find in these river pools are um, there's a range of fish, you've got your swan river goby, 
we often find a, uh, the minnow and also a hardy head. So they're all species that are tolerant of a range of salinities and uh, the invertebrates that live there, many of them are the food sources for the fish. And of course the fish are food sources for your grebes and cormorants that live in the area as well. The river pools also have great cultural significance to the Manang Noongar people who have been the area's traditional custodians for tens of thousands of years. Local elder Eugene Eads explains the area's importance and the Karakarup Creek in particular for the Noongar people. Today we're gathered uh, at a site which is known to Noongar people as the Karakarup Reserve and also behind me you'll see the Karakarup River and uh, these water systems meant so much to the Noongar people. It played a big role in their existence. And as they would come to places like this where there's large amounts of water, there'd be lots of activities that would follow and be carried out. Wherever there was water, fresh water in particular, and artesian water which seeps through the ground, there was life and there were people. And the Noongar people shared those places, those drinking water, areas with animals, likewise with themselves and uh, lots of other things followed. The hunting and the gathering that took place uh, in and around the areas and right now we're in the month in the season of Jilba which is the fifth season in the Noongar calendar and uh, so this time of the year there would be close to rounding up and hunting and gathering turtle. And um, as we look up to the right, where the rapids are falling off the higher level of waterfalls, there's a number of uh, purposes the water had played a role in, from birthing, to drinking, to also providing food, and also ceremonies for our people back in the day. Nestled beside the coastal town of Denmark in the deep south of Western Australia lies the picturesque Wilson Inlet. For over three decades, the local community has worked very hard to protect this estuary and the rivers that flow into it. In 2007, Wilson Inlet and its catchment that covers just over 2,000 square kilometres 
became part of the International Living Lakes Network. This occurred after local community group Green Skills nominated this estuary to bring global attention to the issues facing Australian wetlands. The inlet and its surroundings is the traditional home of the Minang and Pebbleman family groups, part of the Noongar people. Here, Noongar elders, family and friends meet at the Wetland Centre in Denmark and share their stories and links to this land. It's just beautiful out here. Um, it's ancient, you can feel it all around you. Um, and we're looking at these old paperbarks, the Yulba, and these are some of the oldest ones that I've ever seen, just by looking at the bases of them. Um, it's very special, you can feel the spirit of this country and it's all coming back to life again. Um, what do you think about that, Art? Uh, the Ural is a big part in uh, the Noongar survival. What they used to do years ago when they were in the swampland or anything like that, they used the paper bark to um, cover their mimeyes so that the rain doesn't go through. They also use it as matting so that they could um, sleep on a dry surface. So really the um, paper bark played a real important role in Noongar history and uh, Noongar lifestyle. Another important wetland for Noongar people is Blue Lake, which is located in the secluded Jarra Forest of Mount Lindsay National Park. Its Noongar name is Kwar Kaip, or Lake of the Brush Wallaby. In recent years, Noongar elders and youth work teams are helping conserve this place with the support of South Coast NRM's Cultural Connections Project and the WA Department of Parks and Wildlife. Adjacent to Blue Lake are ancient lizard traps. So this is um, one of the lizard traps that I was um, referring to before. And in areas where they were camping and where there was granite rock like this, they would always um, put these lizard traps here and as you're passing through the first thing the lizard does is want to hide and it makes it really easy for us um, to come and get them because a lizard will always um, protect its head and try and hide its head but have a bad trait of leaving the tail out. So that's what these sort of things do and um, we're probably looking at about 100 by 50 metre granite outcrops and they're just covered with lizard traps everywhere. The inlet is a haven for shore and water birds and it is listed in the top 100 most important wetlands for migratory shorebirds in Australia. Local bird watcher and conservationist Brad Kneebone explains the significance of this. Today we're at Morley Beach at the far end of uh, Wilson Inlet and this special and beautiful place is the summer home of uh, many hundreds, often thousands, of migratory shorebirds. They come from the Northern Hemisphere and the Siberian Arctic and tundra, and they arrive here after traveling something like 10 to 12,000 kilometers. These uh, shallows and, and extensive mudflats support over 20 species of migratory shorebird, and these include uh, Familiar species like the redneck stint, common green shank, godwit, and sharp-tailed sandpiper. These birds will spend uh, most of the summer here, uh, together with on nearby wetlands, and they need to put on a lot of weight. To do this, they will eat, be eating benthic invertebrates like worms, um, crustaceans, small crustaceans, and mollusks. Uh, in order to put on the weight that they need to make that journey back to the Northern Hemisphere, which is a, a, a huge distance, which is incredibly risky for them. Not all will survive that journey. Because of the high populations of these shorebirds at Wilson Inlet, it has been identified as a wetland of international significance. And this requires the inlet to be specially managed 
For example, uh, shorebirds need low water levels in summer in order to expose the mudflats that they need to feed on. And that's very important for the migratory and the endemic shorebirds. Landholders in the Wilson Inlet catchment have also taken up the challenge of bringing degraded swamps and lakes on farmland back to life. Mount Barker farmers Arthur and Sue Patterson, who run cattle on their Hay River property, discuss how they have successfully restored a wetland. We've been farming on the block where Ongarup Lagoon is since 1985. We run a few cattle there, but we also like to look after the environment. We've done things like uh, around the house here, we, we've re replanted a whole lot of vegetation. But out where the Ongarup Lagoon is, is a much bigger task. Um, the area around it was just a salty wasteland and uh, it grew nothing. Uh, historically the, the lagoon had been drained and that drain had become blocked up. And uh, we took steps to open up the drain again and drain the salt water out. And over the years we've had about, we took about three or four years to, to flush the salt out of the system. And it, it means that the fauna and flora has changed from salt water stuff back to fresh water. And that was what we were aiming to do. Um, we've also replanted a lot of vegetation around the edge of the lake and uh, that's become a great habitat for local wildlife. Well, the first thing we did was we had a ripper mounder and we ripped and mounded and then planted into those little tiny, tiny plants and almost planted a little fantail, didn't we, in <laughs> one of the holes. He came and planted with us. Um, but the revegetation grew fairly well. We had a couple of disasters, a little flood one year and then a dry year. But on the whole, we've got a pretty good tank. Yeah, it's doing pretty well right now. Wilson Inlet is now a shining light of a waterway being cared for by a local community and community groups. In a world where climate change, pollution and insensitive development is causing widespread decline, it is heartening to have inspiring examples like Wilson Inlet and its waterways where local efforts are making a difference. My grandfather took up Ballage up in 1923 and I'm part of the third generation to manage this farm. My mother and father farmed Ballage up from 1957 through to about 2010 and brought up myself and three siblings. It was a mixed sheep and grain farm. They always had a, a great interest in nature 
and uh, the wildlife and plant life on the property. In the last couple of years, we've expanded our connection with Green Skills into using the property for field days and community art projects where they come and actually camp at the property, use the homestead and sheds. We also uh, encourage our relations from Perth to use the place and it's extensively used. So we're very interested in and keen to share the property with uh, friends and family, other people that are interested in our vision, including artists and the Noongar people. Ballajup Farm is near Cranbrook in WA's Great Southern. Its name means, in the Noongar language, place of many lakes. Since the 1930s, the Hordeacre family, with its strong conservation ethic, have been caring for this property, and now 700 hectares of the farm remain under bushland, lakes, or tree plantations. Green Skills has worked with the owner and local NRM and regional groups to fence off all the bushland and reforestation areas. A range of flora, fauna and wetland surveys have been carried out. The property is now registered with Land for Wildlife. A 111 hectare area has been fenced off as a fauna conservation enclosure with foxes and cats eliminated and native mammals starting to be reintroduced into the enclosure. This has included Quenda or Southern Brown Bandicoot. Gondwana links an environmental initiative to relink country across southwestern Australia from Margaret River all the way through to the edge of the Nullarbor Plain. Balajup's a marvellous property within Gondwana Link. It sits between the Warpole Wilderness area and the Stirling Ranges and it's a huge piece of bushland. It encompasses all sorts of different wetlands and lakes. It has a variety of different habitats. But best of all, it's a place where people can come and learn more about Gondwana Link and more about the land. So Balajup is a great place for people to come and connect to country. Since 2010, GreenSkills has partnered with the Balajup owners to create new initiatives for the property in eco-restoration and education, citizen science, eco-art and cultural connections. These activities and projects have been supported by a range of groups, funding bodies and volunteers. Today, Balajap hosts an active program of environmental art and cultural activities. Here at Balajap, it's a magical place in its history and in its landscape and art is a perfect conduit to really build connection to place and to one another through that artistic process. So people come here, they engage in the land, and then we actually are lucky to have the Butter Factory Studios where we can have exhibitions and have a wider audience catch the inspiration. Well, Balajup is actually a, a unique place with um, the lakes, the, the multiple lake connections and yeah, it's quite a, quite a significant and spiritual place. For me as an artist to um, create something like um, this piece of artwork out here is, um, is actually a, a, a significant thing for not only me but my, my Noongar people because it, um, it opens a doorway for them to come here and, and express their, their art and their feeling for this country and, and to show and teach people the knowledge about this land. This uh, canvas represents um, the, uh, the Bailajup region and it's, um, it's actually not only a, a going to be a map, but it's going to be a, a learning resource for, for this area.
kaya kaya bul mila yong mir mabna tul yubap tul yubap kaya kaya bul mila yong mir mabna tul yubap In April 2017, two community groups, Green Skills and the Great Walk Network, held a field day visiting sites within the Lake Muir Unicup wetland system. These unique wetlands are located in the southwest of Western Australia and form part of the Living Lakes of Gondwanalink. They support a wide variety of habitats, providing a haven for wildlife. The event was guided by Regional Wildlife Officer Ian Wheeler from the WA Parks and Wildlife Service. The Lake Muir Unicup wetlands are systems of wetlands that are really important for migratory birds. So they're listed under the Ramsar Convention and the idea is to protect and conserve wetlands throughout the world. So these areas are actually really special because they contain large numbers of species. We can have anything up to 50,000 molting shell ducks. It's a refuge site. It's also a drought refuge in really dry years. We have extensive areas of peat-based wetlands containing large areas of sedgelands which are really important for various bird species. Uh, primarily the Australasian bittern. We have about 1% of the breeding population so that makes it a very important uh, wetland for their conservation. The group then visited Lake Unicup where Ian discussed what makes these wetlands so special as well as the history of their management and conservation. So the Lake Muir Unicup wetlands are internationally significant. Our obligations under the Ramsar Treaty are to, to try and care for and to maintain and to stop it degrading. So that's where the revegetation comes in. So the revegetation in the upper parts of the catchment help to reduce recharge into the groundwater, which hopefully flows on and protects the wetlands further downstream. So we've got a couple of hundred hectares of revegetation. If you look around here, you'll see that it's all Jaramari. Um, the Jaramari, uh, we're in a lucky position that there was uh, no Phytophthora, and, or, which is Jarrah dieback, and also no salinity issues up on the hill. So we were able to get in here and plant it all back to native species. But as you can see from the trees, they've actually grown really well. Uh, some of the Jarrah are a really nice form, and we're pretty pleased with the growth. It's, um, it's thriving, um, and hopefully another 50, 100 years we'll have a wonderful forest as well. So the site we're actually standing on now was actually an active mine. If you look around you, you'll actually see the remnant vegetation that was left after the peat mining is actually expanding and reclaiming back across the lake floor again. So as you can see behind me, we've got the bomia that existing on the lake floor. And if you look across over into the lake bed uh, further out, we've actually done some replanting. And that's actually um, a bit slow, but it's actually still alive. And uh, we're hoping that eventually that'll take over the lake floor. The Lake Muir wetlands provide habitat for more than 20,000 wetland birds. Over 10 wader species protected under international migratory shorebird agreements, six of the eight endemic southwest freshwater fish species, over 600 species of native plants, and 24 species of priority flora and fauna needing special conservation management. Lake Muir wetlands are amazing. They're um, number one, they're incredibly scenic, they're diverse, they're unbelievably different. Every single one is a different lake. You go from hypersaline through to fresh and they're naturally occurring. The, the species richness is fantastic. The bird life's amazing. Uh, you have rare species, you have common species and they're just, they are just a joy to be around because they're, they're fantastic. The Lake Muir Unicap wetlands face ongoing management challenges. These include loss of bushland vegetation on adjoining farms, the need for ecologically sensitive fire management, spread of dieback disease, and the impacts of feral animals including foxes, cats, deer, pigs, and wild horses. Lake Muir wetlands are a wonderful natural heritage. 
greater public awareness and government funding are needed to help conserve this area in the face of climate change and an uncertain future. Adjacent to the northern boundary of the iconic Stirling Range National Park is one of Western Australia's hidden treasures, a series of ancient salt lakes. These lakes now sit within the agricultural landscape where most of the remnant bushland has been cleared. The rural community of Cranbrook, led by the Gilmai Centre, has embraced the challenge to conserve these wetlands. I'm Karina Bateman, I work with the Gilamai Centre in the Cranbrook area. We're a sustainable ag natural resource management group that works with our local farmers to promote sustainable agriculture, which includes looking after our environment. Working with the environment and with production allows projects like today to flourish and the biodiversity of this amazing area to be available for future generations. Despite many of these lakes being highly saline and intermittently full of water, they are a haven for bird life, including a number of threatened species of resident and migratory shorebirds. I'm Tony Peterson, I'm a volunteer for Green Skills and I've been doing a fair bit of work on the salt lakes around this area. Salt lakes here are significant in that at certain times of year they hold water that uh, isn't available elsewhere. It's especially significant for the waterfowl and for the wading birds. And in some seasons, where these lakes in the North Stirlings hold water and lakes in other areas don't, they can be very significant as uh, roosting, feeding and breeding areas for hooded plovers, one of our threatened bird species. Uh, hooded plovers in Western Australia are a little different from those over east in that over east they favour the sorts of beaches that people favour, as they do here. But in Western Australia a certain amount of breeding takes place on inland lakes. And what's significant about lakes like this one and the others in the area is that the fencing that's been done to protect them from sheep and grazing makes them much more successful as breeding areas for the hooded plovers. A lot of the wading birds here, such as the red-capped dotterels, nest along the beaches and shorelines of these areas and their nests and the young are consequently uh, fairly easy prey for foxes and cats and uh, it's really important in these areas that we get some controls in place so that successful breeding over the years can slowly build the numbers back up. As part of the efforts to understand and care for these wetlands, Cranbrook Primary School has teamed up with water ecologist Geraldine Janicki to survey the food chain that these birds depend on and teach the students about the importance of these lakes. These wetlands are valuable bird habitat because of the invertebrate uh, ecology within them. The slightly fresher wetlands have an amazing amount of microcrustaceans that are food sources for some of the birds that you'll find here, particularly your filter feeders. So this is the algae and aquatic grasses that the swans and other birds, ducks that eat herbaceous material, the teals, the mountain duck or shell duck as it's now called, will be eating this stuff. It's also the fantastic habitat for the invertebrates. Key actions that landholders are taking include fencing and rehabilitating the foreshores of these lakes. So we, uh, we put in yeah, 3.7 k's of fencing right around the lake, which is uh, yeah, to keep the sheep out, um, which is fantastic to 
first went along and just cleared a bit of a path, pushed a few dead limbs and whatever else out of the way. And then, yeah, just erected the fence, let all the trees and shrubs regenerate and birds or whatever and nesting and, yeah, no, it'll be a good thing. Third generation Cranbrook farmer and chairman of the Gilmai Centre, Sam Lehman, summarises what farmers can and are doing for the living lakes of the North Stirlings. So we've got a lot of lakes um, through, through this low-lying country and those, those lakes are, um, if we leave them as they were, the stock just degrade the edges of those lakes and they just get worse and worse and over time those, uh, the edges of those lakes end up blowing up into your paddocks and it's an eyesore and, uh, and it's, it's not something you want to um, just leave be. So over time we've been fencing off lakes probably for the last 15 years to 20 years possibly and um, what we've done is just fenced off best we can around those lakes and uh, planted the right species getting the right advice from through Gillamai and um, Green Skills on what species to plant, how far off the lake's edge we should be um, fencing and uh, basically what, what we can do to make it work. And um, yeah, we've had pretty good success over the years. We've now got most of our lakes fenced off and they're covering. So it's, it's now um, quite pleasant to drive past these lakes and you see the green revenge on the, on the edges. And, um, and a lot of the wildlife that's come back because of the work we've done. On this outing, the students from the Cranbrook Primary School were able to judge the survival and health of the native trees and shrubs they helped plant the previous winter. Here we are at a, one of our eucalypts. This is flat top eight, and you can see it's growing quite well. It's managed to survive the, the first three months, and that's great. These plantings will help restore fauna habitat and protect the fragile shorelines from erosion. They also came away with a better understanding of the ecology of these lakes, their value as a food source for a wide range of birds, and how science can assist in wetland management. Plus, they learnt that studying the environment can be fun. The ongoing efforts to conserve the biodiversity of the North Stirling Lakes demonstrates how a rural community working together can make a big difference to its local environment. <laughs>